Hey everybody, and welcome back to the show. This is the solo cast where I finally get into the dinner party. And I can't tell if a lot of people are like, man, get to the dinner party already, or if it's just me and my own impatience. But I think we're coming to the conclusion of a cycle here. This is the fourth solo cast this quarter, the fourth in the series of experiments. And the first one was all about the Teal Society. The second one got into the similarities between two seemingly different worldviews that are both, I would contest, challenging for us. One is loving your enemies and the other is the scientific method and actually doing it instead of just doing what we want under the guise of reason and logic, which is seems what we mostly do. The third was about the link between accountability and community and the role of community in achieving difficult tasks. And this fourth one is finally going to be about the dinner party. What I'm trying to do here is draw a sense of a dependency between the grand goals, being exposed to different points of view, and the power of community. And if you follow my logic, the dinner party will then have a mythic status and a revolutionary role in your life and in the evolution of our society. So this is how it works. If the dinner party is done correctly, we build community. And it is through community that we tighten our links of accountability to one another. And we expose ourselves to these other points of view, but in a way that we can't reject them. So normally if we're exposed to a contradictory point of view, it would be like, oh, that guy's just an idiot. But if it's someone that you're already connected with, you already have these like loving bonds of community, then it has to kind of pierce that intellectual armor that we're putting up and I'm able to get a little bit deeper and ask the question of like, okay, what is really going on here? What is really different about these points of view? What can I learn from this other person, right? We can't just make them idiots or capital wrong because of, they came from someone we love. So it's through the community and this exposure to contradictory worldviews that we can complement our own and integrate that knowledge and get to this teal society that I've been going on and on and on about. So, so back to the dinner party, and I'm gonna start with a quote that really captures the essence of what I'm trying to do. And it's a quote from an ancient Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu. A leader is best when people barely know he exists. And when his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. So for me, for this style of dinner party, that feeling of participation and co-creation and mutual triumph really is the key. And it's way more important than whether you used matching plates or even own matching plates or whether the rice is soggy or burnt or most of the other things that might happen in a kitchen, except for the whole sugar salt switch thing like that you definitely do not want to do and it could just kill the whole thing but aside from that the the real the real important thing is the sense of like co-creation and participation so here are some concrete steps for making a laozu style dinner party and there's seven of them that i came up with this morning i've never tried to encapsulate this before but i was trying to figure like what do we do in these events that makes them so fun and it allows like such the sense of co-creation and community building and joy and lack of judgment. I think that's really the key. What I hope these seven steps get us to is a judgment-free zone. So then it becomes not about the food or any kind of like ego or shame thing about whether I can cook to just like, oh, we're hanging out doing something that we all had to do anyways, which was eat. Step one, plant the idea in advance. So this is just like, setting the norms for people so if people think that you're like hey come over for a six at dinner they think they're going to eat at six um but at six is when you start cooking together because the point here is not that they come and you have everything like martha stewart style perfectly served for them but actually that they get in and get their hands dirty we just want to let people know and plant this idea from the beginning so they're like slowly open to it and getting ready for it if it's not their normal culture so it's the kind of thing like hey would you like to come over have this dinner party we're going to cook dinner together Maybe come at like 5.30, we're probably gonna eat around seven. And so people just know like, oh, there's this other space. It's not like I get there and then everything is just served to me. So it's, it's, it's subtle, but it's, it's an important pillar because it already starts planting the intention in their minds of what's gonna happen. Two, have a loose plan. The thing I always think of is make the best of plans and then write them on the sand at low tide. And so the idea is that you have like a loose idea of a menu so you can request that people bring things or you can do a little shopping. But if one of those things is not available, rather than be like, oh, I need to go and interrupt this event to get something or, oh no, I can't believe you forgot it. 
you just pivot because it doesn't matter because it's not about the food. So that's that's the like for me like the Lao philosophy on this is that the dinner party is not about the food, it's about the togetherness. And so the last thing I ever want someone to do is leave because that breaks the actual spell and the spell is the togetherness of like working on something together. Step three is to ask everyone to bring something. So everyone is always going to say, what should I bring? And most of the time, I catch myself doing this all the time, you say, oh, nothing, I got it. But that is robbing an opportunity for contribution and participation. So I want everyone to feel that they got to bring something, but we don't want them to bring a product. We don't want them to bring like seven layer guacamole dip or I don't know, something that they've already made or something they've already purchased. We want them to bring an ingredient that everyone is gonna work on together. So it's like if you're making bananas foster for dinner, like yeah, for dessert, somebody brings the bananas, maybe someone brings the brown sugar if you don't have any. And then like someone else is using the items that the other person brought and it's just, it's like, where'd that go? Oh, it's in that guy's backpack. And then it just, it just creates more subtle interlacings and connections that way. So not a finished product, but an ingredient, step three. So review, step one, plant the idea in advance, make sure everyone knows what they're getting into subtly, not really explicitly. Two, have a loose plan and don't worry about it. And three, everyone comes with something to contribute and they feel like, all right, I'm already a part of this. Step four, explore the space, kind of like that cowbell video from Saturday Night Live. This is important because most people or many people don't have kitchens that are enormous. And if you're gonna have like four or five people over, maybe there's not enough space. And so the default cultural implication is that, oh, okay, this one person's gonna cook and the other people are gonna like, leave and not be present in the kitchen and they'll be hanging out doing something else but what we want to do is expand the domain of the party to the entire house or apartment so you can just send them to different corners with cutting boards i mean if you have more cutting boards and knives that makes this thing like really much easier then you could just send people be like oh you need to like cut some vegetables in the bathroom because that's the only space available like go do that uh so that's that's what i mean explore the space architecturally when like turn the whole zone into a kitchen if near be and then explore all the different spaces of the party. So there's the food, important, but there's also like the drinks, very important. Social lubrication, especially if people drink alcohol, having someone like making the drinks, opening the drinks, offering the drinks, mixing the cocktails, even like sparkling water, kombucha, juice, tea, hot water, wh whatever it is, it all has a little bit of, even just like herbal tea, it has this art to it. There's this time, there's all these steps, there's this intention. Oh yeah, let me make that for you. Let me heat up the water. Let me get out the chamomile. Let me infuse it. Let me hand it to you. All of that builds this sense of like togetherness and hospitality and connection and interrelationship. So the space is both the architectural space and then the space of the party, which is the food, the drink, the music, having different people choose the music, the lighting. It's all part of the space that people can co-create. And so when people are coming over and it's like, all right, we're having this dinner party. If there's not something specific for someone to do it's like all right all the vegetable chopping is under control I'll be like oh yeah could you put on your favorite playlist or yeah could you work move some of these lamps or lower some of these lamps so like the lighting is a little bit better like all these things just get people like more related and more like tied into the moment in your space it's like oh, all of a sudden i'm moving the lamp of someone i've never met before and you just feel closer there's a sense of like intimacy or vulnerability with that that uh that's beautiful that's what i'm trying to create and i'm just putting these words in laozu's mouth because he's dead and he can't do anything it's what laozu would want so just like do what laozu would want all right so let's use the space number five is give everyone a task this is like everyone brings something everyone should be doing something most of the time so the focus all of the intention is in the same place and that way when the result is there everyone feels like they know that they were essential to that and they participated in that if there's someone who isn't involved in it and they just come as a consumer, they're not gonna have the same sense of involvement in, um, and commitment, you know, and this like togetherness of having created this beautiful thing together. Step six, find the challenge. So again, again, this is, this is like my whole thing of getting people right near their stretch zone, like out of the comfort zone as much as we can, but we don't want them to freak out. So the idea if someone is like, oh, they're like, I actually don't know how to, chop a tomato or I've never peeled garlic, then it's like, oh, then that is the perfect task for you. So like you might even ask like, which of these things feels like least comfortable to you? And let's do that one, like grating beets or doing garlic or uh, preheating the oven. You know, it doesn't matter what it is, but the idea is to like work with people to get out of the comfort zone. And then when they're out of their comfort zone, respond with a lack of judgment. 
because the idea and this is the seventh one existence is the perfection it's like with kids art the point is not for them to be great at it the point is just that for them to do it and to be seen doing it and to be appreciated for the fact that they're doing it so the whole thing with the rice is like all right watch the rice 11 times someone just watches the rice that's that's the point it's not really how well they watch the rice although we'll know that in our digestive systems later the the point is just doing the thing putting in the effort and the sweat and then cooking it and later being like yeah man i watched that rice 11 times that's it so existence is perfection and all of these things what we're trying to create is this no judgment zone so the idea is not that like that rice is a little bit overcooked or you should have done x or even I mean, and the host is just like such a leader in this regard if you start making disclaimers about how bad it's going to be or oh you know i think that's a little soggy or i probably added too much sugar then everyone's going to go down that road of actually focusing on the food and trying to judge it and compare it to some food in a restaurant that they had or they didn't or something they saw on tv where that's not the point at all because you're not making the best food if you want the best food you go to san francisco and some fancy restaurant that's the best food or singapore but you're making the best experience for these people to connect with you and each other. That's like the Lao Tzu thing. And they're like, wow, we did it. There's no judgment in that, in that we did it phrase. There's this existence as a perfection. Either we didn't do it, we hadn't done it an hour ago, and we did it. So that to me, it's, this is like, I'm, I'm sharing, this is gold. This is gold here. I hope you, um, I don't normally say that kind of stuff, but this is really gold. People don't. They don't get this and they go through life thinking that food is either a task to be accomplished or this like epicurean thing and this is a whole other dimension of it's just a great excuse to love people and to be in a no judgment space and have all of this other relationship and intimacy and connection come out of it and that is what's really going on and all of the varieties of sense and color and taste and smell are just excuses or pretexts to bring us into that space of intimacy together. So that's what that's what Lao Tzu thinks about the dinner party, and I'm just his humble student. So try it out. Let me know what you think. Hi everyone, this is Martin San, your producer, audio editor, and sound designer in chief for the 10,000 Heroes team. I just wanted to take a minute to thank you for listening to our show. Let me tell you a couple of things. 10,000 Heroes is brought to you by the team at Momentum Lab. Pierre does our artwork. DJ Plainview composed our theme music and I handle all the editing, production and sound design. Please, if you like the show, follow it, rate it, tell your friends about it and write to us. That really helps us make the impact we want to make. And now we are closing this episode with a word from our main sponsor who also happens to be our host, Anchor. And now a message from our sponsor, me again. 10,000 Heroes is brought to you by Momentum Lab. I normally refer to Momentum Lab as a coaching program or a goal accelerator, but it's really more like a master's degree in life. When you join Momentum Lab, we help you get crystal clear on what it is you actually want, who you want to be, what you want to do, and how you want to contribute. And then we get into all the painful details of what has been blocking you this whole time. And then we give you the knowledge, the tools, and the support you need to get there. Sometimes that's a spreadsheet, sometimes it's a mindset hack, sometimes it's a lecture, and sometimes it's a hug. Our only attachment is to your higher self. So when you're ready to be the next version of yourself, in your business, for your family, or just for your own sense of fulfillment, draw me a line. Bye.